Hi everyone, my name is Dr. Bhavna Sharma. I work as a medical registrar in NHS London and this is your PLAB1 lecture series by Teach Your Academy on the topic of Rheumatology. Now the way that the Rheumatology appears on the PLAB1 exam is that you have a number of diseases with a number of classical clinchers which if you don't know the exact clincher for each disease then you might get confused in between the overlap signs and symptoms. So I've tried to make that a little bit easier by talking about the pathognomic signs uh, or symptoms which if you see on your PLAB1 exam you should be able to tick the correct answer quite easily. Alright, now let's start with Paget's disease. Now the way that I try to remember Paget's disease is by bone gone mad. So uh, the picture that you see on your screen is actually from the 16th century and it is one of the earliest pictures that we have available for Paget's um, disease. Um, it's quite rudely called by the name of the ugly duchess. Uh, but the face that we see on this picture is quite um, pathognomic of Paget's disease. I'll explain that a little bit uh, later on as to why. But the thing that you need to remember first about Paget's disease is it's basically a disease of increased bone turnover. But quite, quite counterintuitively, it starts out with increased osteoclastic activity. So osteoclasts are your bone destroying cells. So now the bone destroying cells are functioning quite a lot in, in Paget's disease. Now what that's going to do is that it's going to create areas of bone which are a little bit faulty. So in order to repair that, the osteoblast or the bone forming cells are going to increase. And this cycle of increased osteoclastic activity and resultant osteoblastic activity is going to create what we call a woven bone pattern or a lamellar bone pattern or bone which is a little bit faulty. If you can imagine, if you've got someone in a building who's constantly destroying furniture around and we're trying to replace that furniture quite rapidly, the quality of the building is going to decline. So that's the essence of Paget's disease. On your screen, you can see two images of what a skull might look like in Paget's disease. So the classical descriptor is cotton wool spots. You can actually see spots on the skull which are a little bit bright and some spots which are a little bit dark. The bright spots are where you have hard bone and the uh, less bright spots or the grayer spots are going to be the spots with the softer or the less deformed, uh, more deformed bone. That's just what you need to remember. If you see these cotton wool spots, that's your clincher for Paget's disease. The way that it's usually described on your PLAB1 exam is the classical history is of an old gentleman with the raised alkaline phosphatase. Um, the calcium and the phosphate are going to be normal. Please remember this, this is going to become important when we try and differentiate it from hyperparathyroidism. On the PET scan that you can see on your screen, you can see certain areas of increased uptake. So that's basically the areas where bone formation is taking place rapidly. So when you do a PET scan, these areas suck up the glucose quite well and that's why they appear a little bit dark. So going back to the image that we saw earlier, um, this description of frontal bossing. So the head, the frontal bone looks a little bit thicker. The maxillary areas, and the cheekbone itself in total appears a little bit protruded. This was also sometimes quite rudely called by the name of lion face. So the facial description is quite similar to what they thought was a lion. And that's what um, is what we classically call Paget's disease. The treatment for this is bisphosphonates, uh, which is basically to counteract the increased bone turnover. The complications of Paget's disease, the one that does appear on your exam quite a lot is uh, deformed bones, which obviously because you're producing bones at a rapid rate. Um, and the second thing that you do see on your PLAB1 exam is that the patients might complain of an increased hat size. So remember the picture that you see on your screen, the hat is quite big. So that's what the patients complain of. Uh, remember guys, 
um, you might remember that in acromegaly which is growth hormone increase after uh, adulthood is accompanied by an increase in shoe size ring size and glove size while Paget's disease is an increase in hat size so don't get a little confused about that another thing which might appear on your plab one exam is that these individuals often have hearing deformities so if you can imagine if there's increased bone turnover especially around the skull area that might impinge on your auditory nerve and that's why patients might complain of hearing loss so that's it, nothing else to know about Paget's disease. Marfan syndrome. Now this syndrome is actually said to be um, in one of the very famous American presidents, Abraham Lincoln. If you see him, you can see that he was quite tall. He had quite long arms and his face was quite long as well. And if you notice his fingers, his fingers are quite long or what we call arachnodactyly. Remember, we discussed this in our previous lecture on CT scans about arachin meaning spider so long spidery fingers they're often said to be related to marfan syndrome or they're called what we call a marfanoid habitus so the features the physical features of marfan syndrome are sometimes called marfanoid habitus there are a number of diseases which might just have the marfanoid habitus but now we're just concentrating on marfan syndrome which is the physical features as well as a little other things that we're going to discuss which might be quite consequential to the patient. Now the way that I try to remember Marfan syndrome is by using um, the same spelling. So M stands for mitral valve prolapse. So this basically in Marfan syndrome the disorder is in the fibrillin 1 Gene. So basically fibrillin is a component of connective tissue. So all of the connective tissue structure is going to get affected in Marfan syndrome. Um, so if you can imagine if the connective tissue is getting affected, the big things that we can think about are blood vessels and retina and the spine. So blood vessels, mitral valve um, as well as the aorta. If you guys know a little bit of cardiology, you might remember that the, uh, the mitral valve has an apparatus which anchors it to the heart, which is composed of connective tissue. An essential component of this is fibrillin. So in case where the anchoring filaments are affected by the fibrillin being affected, the valve will start to go back because it doesn't have an anchor to hold it onto the heart. And that's why in such patients have mitral valve prolapse. Another thing which might happen, you might remember the aortic root, so the origin of the aorta, uh, where it starts in the heart is also anchored by connective tissue filaments. So if these are affected by an absence of fibrillin, then you might have aortic root dilatation. Because the aortic root is dilated, the aortic valve opens up and these patients often have aortic regurgitation. If you come and give the MRCP exam and the MRCP PACES exam, you might see a lot of patients with Marfan syndrome and they might have the classical murmurs of aortic regurgitation and mitral regurgitation along with a Marfanoid habitus. Um, the last two things which are seen in Marfan syndrome, N and S, are nearsightedness. So basically, again, the ciliary body is something which anchors the lens in the eye. So just, just something which is going to hold the lens in its place. As you can imagine, similar to the aorta and the mitral valve, if the fibrillin is absent or it's a little bit defective, the lens is not anchored in its place and you might have lens dislocation. In this case, the inferior lens uh, uh, filaments are affected first. So that's why the classical descriptor is upward dislocation of lens. Another thing which is going to appear later on, homocysteinuria is a little bit different where the lens dislocates downwards. So in Marfan, the lens goes up, homocysteinuria, the lens goes down. Scoliosis. Now, because it's a disorder of connective tissue, it might affect the spine and the patients might have a 
crooked spine or scoliosis something which is related to it um, it might cause dilatation of the dural sac or the bottom of the spinal sac which we call dural ectasias and such patients might complain of a lot of back pain but the things that you classically need to remember for marfins is the wide arm span so usually when a person stands up and they spread their arms wide the width of the arms is equal to the height of the person but in marfins the arm span is wider as you can see the gentleman who's swimming in the pool you might notice that his arms look very very wide so that's one of your clinchers the marfinoid habitus another thing is that because they've got very very long fingers they might uh, be able to do what we call the thumb sign or the wrist sign so they might be able to take their wrist uh, uh, might be able to take their fingers around their wrist and the fingers overlap like you can see in the picture or when they cl uh, close their uh, fist you might be able to see the thumb coming out because that's basically the way the fingers are quite long and the two murmurs that you need to remember the aortic regurgitation mitral valve prolapse that's it we're done with marfan syndrome if you're confused at any point just remember abraham lincoln moving on gout now the first description which uh, this is a very interesting picture uh, which i found about the early descriptors of gout was that as if the devil was biting your toe so the patients they often wake up with a very hot red swollen toe and that's the classical descriptor of gout which appears on your blab 1 exam the main joint as you can see on the x ray is the first metatarsophalangeal joint or just the big toe joint if you're very confused so this is going to be in acute attack so usually a patient um unlike the other types of arthritis that we're going to discuss the patient usually presents in the form of discrete attack so they'll have discrete episodes of gouty arthritis or flare ups of gout in which they'll have these acutely swollen joints guys you must remember for your blab 1 exam as well as your blab 2 exam Uh, as well as you know, for your MRCP and future practice, whenever you see a patient with a hot, red, swollen joint, the first thing that you have to rule out is septic arthritis. So, an acute bacterial infection is actually the most dangerous complication that we have to rule out when we see a patient with this classical joint descriptor. Even if you're very sure it's gout, the first investigation is always joint aspiration. When you do a joint aspiration in gout, you don't see any um, organisms, but what you see are the classical needle-shaped negatively bifringent crystals, which you can see on your screen. Just remember N and N, needle and negative. I don't want you to worry too much about bifringence is basically related to the way that the needles react to light but for your exam just remember N and N and these are actually monosodium urate crystals remember urate we're going to discuss this in the management of gout now i talked about this being in discrete episodes of on and off and flare ups sometimes when a patient has uncontrolled gout or untreated gout for a long period of time they might develop what we call tophi which you can see on the top of the screen which are basically inflamed and calcified uh, joint deformities as you can see on the screen these are often found in the fingers and the ear as well on your exams they often show you pictures of tophi on the ear and that's going to be a clincher that this is a patient with gout now we talked about the way that when we aspirated the joint we found these urate crystals so the pathogenesis of gout is basically you've got a lot of uric acid in the body and then because it's uric acid it's not really quite soluble so it gets deposited in the joint fluid in the form of these urate crystals so the treatment is preventing this so you prevent either hyperuricemia so you give the patient dietary advice avoid uh, foods with high uric acid content avoid drugs which impair the excretion of uric acid 
but foremost if a patient has gout guys please be kind the first thing that you always do is give the patient painkillers so NSAIDs are always going to be your first line in management one thing that we very commonly use in the NHS is naproxen which is quite good for any type of arthritis the second thing that you would give to a patient who's had an acute attack of gout is colchicine the thing that you need to remember about colchicine is that it does cause a lot of GI side effects um, now that the patient has had one attack of gout they might be considered for long-term therapy particularly if a patient has had two attacks of gout in 12 months they've got TOFI, they've got renal disease they've got renal stones or they are on chemotherapy drugs remember that if someone is on chemotherapy that's going to increase the breakdown of cells red cells especially and that's what is going to bring the uric acid levels up so if someone is on chemotherapy sometimes we need to start them on urate lowering therapy and if people are on diuretics um, it also becomes important because those are going to decrease the secretion of uric acid now the two big drugs which we use are allopurinol and febroxstat uh, which is so the second one is actually just an alternative a patient has uh, uh, side effects with allopurinol but just remember that the first line in management is always NSAIDs guys one thing which they do ask on your PLAB1 exam is that if a patient is already on allopurinol and they have an acute attack of gout then you're not going to stop the allopurinol while if someone has an acute attack of gout you do not start them immediately on allopurinol you give it a period of gap all right so that was everything that you need to know about gout for your PLAB1 exam now the brother of gout which is pseudo gout so it's like gout but it's a little bit different how is it different the classical descriptor on your plab 1 exam of pseudo gout is going to be an elderly gentleman who's either got hemochromatosis wilson's disease some parathyroid or thyroid problem acromegaly and they're going to come in with an acutely swollen knee joint like we talked about in any acutely swollen joint especially if it's red and hot you always do a joint aspiration so in the joint aspiration you'll see calcium pyrophosphate deposits very very important gets asked in your exam quite a lot this is the opposite of gout because it's pseudo gout so instead of being negatively bifringent and needle shaped these are going to be rhomboid and positively bifringent that's it you don't need to know anything else about pseudo gout for your PLAB1 exam ankylosing spondylitis so this is classically going to be a young man who's going to come to you with low back pain and stiffness now if you try and break down the words ankylosing spondylitis they actually tell you what it is so ankylosis basically means fusion and spondylitis means the back anything related to the back so in ankylosing spondylitis you've got inflammation of the joints um, of the back mainly the spine and then when the inflammation gets quite chronic it might actually cause fusion of the vertebrae or what we call the bamboo spine one thing which is quite unique for ankylosing spondylitis and actually the first descriptors of ankylosing spondylitis as you can see on the screen talked about this young gentleman who after a period of exercise started to feel is so apical fibrosis so that's basically the top of the lungs getting fibrosis anterior uveitis a red painful eye aortic regurgitation achilles tendonitis so inflammation of the achilles tendon av node block amyloidosis 
corda equina because if, as you can imagine if there's something affecting the spine or causing fusion of the spine it's obviously going to affect the bottom of the spinal cord and peripheral arthritis because the gentleman classically has back pain and stiffness what we do the test that we do is actually the modified schober's test which is basically asking the gentleman uh, we mark a point on the spine 10 cm above and 5 cm below the L5 vertebrae and ask the gentleman to lean forward and then we measure the expansion of the spine and in ankylosing spondylitis because there's a fusion of the joints the the, the expansion will be limited so just remember that the expansion is affected so all of the things are related to the same this is an hla b27 related disease which is something which does appear on your exam one thing you need to know that this is a part of the family of what we call the sero negative spondyloarthropathies don't get confused by sero negative that basically means rheumatoid factor negative so arthritis but rheumatoid factor negative back pain young male which gets better with exercise that's your clincher for ankylosing spondylitis that's all you need to know about your plab 1 exam if you're a little bit curious the treatment options are quite similar to a rheumatoid arthritis where we basically employ nsaids and exercise as well as disease modifying drugs and biologics all right moving on we move on to systemic lupus erythematosus guys you might remember something called the great imitators of disease okay so there are some diseases in the body which do appear in a number of ways one of the examples is leprosy uh, another example is syphilis and tuberculosis sle is also one of them because sle has a number of complications which you can see on the screen almost all organs are affected in sle so how do we identify it on our exam pathognomic things which appear on sle is that you'll have a young lady with the classical butterfly rash so um if you break down the word sle it means systemic lupus erythematosus in latin lupus means wolf and the french derivative of lupus means the mask that ladies they said that the ladies used to wear to cover up their butterfly rash lupus in latin means wolf so they thought that the appearance of the butterfly rash was similar to a fur pattern of a wolf um quite rudely but that's something that we can try and remember sle by is by remembering the classical wolf like or the mask like rash on the face erythematosus redness so if you see a young lady with a butterfly rash on your exam you tick sle other things which are a part of the american college of rheumatology classification or diagnosis of sle include uh, renal symptoms so the mnemonic for this is rash on mates so renal symptoms arthritis serological uh, things serositis pleuritis and pericarditis so basically fluid accumulation either in the lungs or around the heart hematological things like a drop in um, white cell count platelets and anemia ulcers are quite important oral and nasopharyngeal ulcers are quite um, related to sle and often a part of plab 1 question stems um the antibodies that you need to know about sle are double stranded dna and anti smith antibodies they might have a false positive syphilis test which is quite important to remember as well and uh, what you need to also remember about the rash in sle is that it tends to get worse with the sun so two things which are going to make you clinch the diagnosis are ulcers and the classical rash and it's a young female who's going to have it two things which i just want you to remember while we're talking about um, sle are anti phospholipid antibodies and um, drug induced uh, lupus so anti phospholipid antibodies is uh, or anti phospho apla is uh, something which might appear on your exam in the form of a female who's got a thro- uh, th- who's got thrombophilia or a history of multiple miscarriages 
basically uh, the things that you need to remember along with SLE are your two disorders of antiphospholipid antibody syndrome and drug induced lupus so antiphospholipid antibody syndrome is related to anti cardiolipin antibodies what you need to remember is that this is a state of thrombosis which can be related to SLE and it is often um, sometimes it can become quite problematic when you have a female who's trying to get pregnant because this increases the tendency of blood to clot the treatment for this um, includes low dose aspirin and heparin another thing which you need to remember when we're talking about um, SLE and its association is drug induced lupus so this is basically going to be someone with anti histone antibodies which affects the metabolism of three classical drugs procainamide hydralazine and quinidine so it's basically related to the acetylation of these drugs so when they are given this drug they might develop arthritis myalgia and rash so just remember those those two things when we're talking about SLE and its associations they might be separate from SLE but they're sometimes associated as well they're in the same family so i tried to mention them here so the way that i try to remember eller danlos syndrome is by the term elastic syndrome so e for elastic so this is basically someone who's got defective type 3 collagen so If you are confused as to what type of collagen is related to Eller Danlos syndrome, so Eller Danlos syndrome has three let or three words in it. So type three collagen. Uh, this is basically going to be someone who's got defective collagen. So they've got a very elastic skin. They've got a very elastic and fragile skin because remember, skin has a lot of collagen in it. um another thing uh, another part of the body which has a lot of collagen in it are the joints so this uh, individual will have joint hypermobility so as you can see on the screen they are able to bend their finger backwards um they are able to take their thumb to their wrist they are able to turn their elbow backwards they are able to go down onto the ground with their head uh, with their hands spread about so lot of joint hypermobility but because the collagen is defective um the joints do get dislocated quite fast the classical uh, skin abnormality that we do see along with eller danlos syndrome is what we call the cigarette paper burns which you can see on the screen because it's a very thin and fragile skin it's often susceptible to bruising and scarring all the connective tissue disorders are going to create the same things so similar to marfan's aortic regurgitation mitral valve prolapse one thing which you might see on the fundoscopy of these patients is angioid retinal streaks so they basically uh, breaks in the retinal membrane or the brooks membrane where you can see these red spots where because of deficiency of collagen the retinal uh, membrane has broken down and that's why there's a little bit of bleeding spots which you can see on the fundoscopy or what we call the angioid retinal streaks so the things that you need to remember about eller danlos type 3 collagen elastic skin elastic joints and angioid retinal streaks this was often quite um, the literature for eller danlos syndrome was a lot of people who used to work in circuses and they used to perform these acts of trying to move their joints about or trying to stretch their skin um uh, if you're familiar with rupaul's drag race one of the one of the contestants was also had um eller danlos syndrome that's so that's just a little bit of trivia for you with regards to eller danlos syndrome there actually quite a difference in the severity of eller danlos syndrome and about 11 to 13 types have been described but the things that you uh, need to remember for your plab 1 exam are quite classic and if you just remember what's on the screen you should be good to go all right moving on systemic sclerosis or what i try to remember by is stone disease so sclerosis whenever you see the term sclerosis it stands for hardening so it's the previous diseases that we talked about there was a deficiency of connective tissue in systemic sclerosis we have increased amount of collagen in the body so 
everything is now going to become the opposite so you'll have someone who's got a lot of collagen in their skin so their skin is going to look very tightened as you can see the lady's face the skin looks really tight and shiny and there's fibrosis of the skin so it looks hard as well if you look at the fingers the fingers have a lot of tightening in them so they often become um, permanently uh, deformed like that and there's a lot of fibrosis which you can see as the tight red hard skin so that's going to be the skin manifestations of systemic sclerosis now that we're talking about systemic sclerosis you can actually divide them into three types the first one is that what we've just talked about which is scleroderma just the skin involvement of increased collagen the rest of the two are diffuse cutaneous systemic sclerosis and limited cutaneous systemic sclerosis. The way that you can remember this by is um, limited cutaneous systemic sclerosis is sclerosis up to the elbows. So you'll have someone with a lot of facial and distal limb involvement. Um, they might have Raynaud's as well. You should remember Raynaud's which is active vasospasm of the arteries of the hand relation to related to cold. So they might have Raynaud's as the first sign. One thing that you need to remember and you need to memorize is that limited cutaneous system sclerosis is related to anti-centromere antibodies. Very very important to know for your PLAB1 exam. Diffuse cutaneous systemic sclerosis is beyond the elbow so it's now going to involve the lungs so there's going to be respiratory involvement in the form of pulmonary hypertension they might have a renal disease and associated hypertension and it's related to SCL70 antibodies the way that I try to remember this by is that because the name is limited cutaneous systemic sclerosis so cutaneous so centromere and diffuse cutaneous systemic sclerosis because it's more systemic that's why it's SCL70 so S for systemic and S for SCL70 so that's how I try to remember this this does appear on the paces quite a lot but for your PLAB1 exam if you just remember the antibodies that should be enough now we talked about limited um, cutaneous systemic sclerosis being related to Crest syndrome. This also appears a lot on your PLAB1 exam. Like we talked about, this is an excess of collagen. And when you have excess of collagen, it tends to deposit calcium around it as well. So the first thing that you see in Crest syndrome is C. C stands for calcinosis. So you'll see calcium deposits on the skin. We talked about Raynaud's phenomenon already, so that's what R stands for in Crest syndrome. Now, if you remember, the esophagus is uh, esophagus is actually a muscular organ, so it needs to pump the food into the stomach. So muscles need to act. So if if you can imagine, there's an excess of collagen or an excess of connective tissue that's actually going to replace the muscles. And that's when you're going to have symptoms of esophageal dysfunction, which are often seen in Crest syndrome. Sclerodactyly, we talked about tightening and thickening of uh, fingers and hands and telling chectasia, which are basically dilated capillaries. So if you can imagine that their skin is filled with collagen, it's not getting enough blood. So the capillaries will get dilated and you'll see telling chectasias. So the way that we differentiate between diffuse and limited is that the big organs, the kidneys and the lungs are more in diffuse while um, the Crest syndrome as well as the skin involvement up to the elbows are going to be related to the limited type. That's it. Nothing else that you need to know up for your PLAB1 exam. Now the last thing that we'll do today is that we'll talk about Jogren syndrome. A little bit of trivia, Venus Williams, the very famous tennis player, um, is known to have Jogren syndrome and she's been quite vocal about Jogren syndrome and spreading awareness about it. Jogren syndrome is basically a disorder of what I try to remember as is dry eye and dry mouth. So 
all the places which need lubrication so eyes which obviously need lubrication to maintain proper vision mouth um vaginal dryness and arthralgia because that's basically the joint getting uh, dried up so that's going to cause pain those are affected in jogren syndrome because basically it's an autoimmune disease where the lymphocytes attack these special glands the thing that you need to remember is that the antibodies related to jogren syndrome so the way that i try to remember it by is a very famous bollywood song which you might not remember but you can remember the image so ro and la so those are the antibodies that you look for in a patient with jogren syndrome one classical descriptor of jogren syndrome is that you might have enlarged parotid glands because they are also one of the saliva producing glands so if they get infiltrated by lymphocytes you might have the characteristic facial appearance that you can see on the screen one extra point that you might want to know if you want to give advanced exams or you want to get full marks on your plab 1 is that it is related to renal tubular acidosis the cute kidney at the bottom of the screen might make you remember so because it's an autoimmune disorder the treatment for it is largely supportive this is basically going to be just artificial saliva and artificial ear drops and lubricants The image that you see on the middle of the screen is actually the Schirmer's test which is actually used to assess whether a patient might or may not have a dry eye. So you basically put this uh, paper strip into the patient's eye and look for the um, the place where the fluid fills up. So you look at the number of uh, centimeters that it's filling up with fluid. So if it fills up a little less that means the patient might have dry eye. bonus points because it's a lymphocytic infiltration if you do a biopsy of the parotid gland you might be able to see lots of lymphocytes so that's it for today um this is this lecture will be continued with a series of further lectures on rheumatology and various other plab 1 topics i hope you guys have learned something new today Remember guys we talked about lot of specific appearances and often quite rude words used to describe diseases these are only to help make your learning easy but remember every disease a doctor is supposed to treat the patient not judge the patient and to be a good doctor you need to have sympathy and empathy and i would not really advise using all of these um facial features or rude words when you're talking to patients about their disease just be a little sensitive and keep studying good luck